Okay, well, thanks very much, Patrick, and uh, thanks very much to the Haven Center for uh, inviting me. Um, and I've got to know some of the people uh, in the audience over the past couple of days, and I have to say, uh, it's really been energizing for me to, to meet uh, people who uh, are really interested in some of the stuff that I'm interested in, and uh, stuff that is really, really crucial right now uh, in American politics. So, thanks very much for coming. I uh, you know uh, how much everybody's time is at a premium, and I, I really do appreciate it. So um, yesterday, we looked at the set of circumstances that led a lot of Americans to lose support for labor liberalism in the 1970s. Today, I'm going to discuss how anti-union efforts on the right have been able to shape the political conversation around unions and government intervention over the past 50 years. So yesterday, we kind of looked at the, the decline of labor liberalism. Now we're going to talk about what was kind of going on on the right uh, at the same time. And my entry point for doing this uh, today is going to be with the Supreme Court. So here's an image of uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, in the spirit of historical reenactment, I thought I might dress up like a Supreme Court justice. Uh, I unfortunately uh, left my robe back in Green Bay. It's always like the last thing that you think to pack. Um, uh, but uh, I'm sure back in June, uh, many of you, like me, were anxiously awaiting uh, the latest uh, decisions from the Supreme Court. Am I the only one here uh, who religiously really reads SCOTUS blog? Uh, okay, so. I, I'm not alone, all right? You don't have more interesting lives than me, that's good. Um, like the last few summers, we had a highly controversial, well-publicized case that shook up the political landscape. The biggest case, of course, uh, uh, the biggest case, of course, that everybody was talking about was the Hobby Lobby case, which has a lot of implications. I'm sure many of you are aware of some of those implications, and we don't have to talk about them now. But I suppose in an upcoming Supreme Court cycle, we'll be asking if corporations, now that they have more right to free speech and more religious rights if, if for the purposes of a well-regulated militia, corporations will soon have uh, the right to bear firearms. Uh, that may be a Supreme Court case down the, down the road. Uh, but the case I was watching so closely was the other case, uh, the other big case, decided on June 30 at the same day as the Hobby Lobby case, which was quite literally a less sexier case uh, than Hobby Lobby. And uh, this was a case called Harris versus Quinn. Now, for those of you who may not have been following this case as closely as I was, uh, an Illinois home care worker named Pamela Harris and a handful of other worker, home care workers, eight total, so eight workers out of about 20,000, sued the state of Illinois in order to have the compulsory fair share fees, uh, so fair share uh, fees paid to the Service Employees International Union invalidated. So just a little bit of backstory. Uh, back in 2003, Governor Rod Blagojevich, uh, you remember him? I think he's, is he in prison still? Okay, he's in prison. Uh, signed a bill into law recognizing home care workers who in Illinois are paid through the state's Medicaid program. Um, uh, so he recognized them as public employees, which then gave them collective bargaining rights. Now, home care workers who at the time made around $7 an hour, and like home care workers everywhere in the U.S., uh, tend to be overwhelmingly female and disproportionately minority, voted to unionize as a local of the SEIU. Illinois, like about 20 other states in the U.S., allow pub Illinois allows public sector unions to negotiate, uh, again, what's called a, a fair share, or sometimes this is called an agency fee arrangement. Under this kind of agreement, all members of a bargaining unit, whether they're uh, union members or not, are obligated to pay the union, in this case, it would be the SEIU, for, for the services rendered on the part of the union in, in representing them in uh, collective bargaining. Um, they don't pay, importantly, they don't pay dues, okay, so they're not members of the union if they're just paying agency fees. Uh, this kind of, a, of an arrangement is an imperative for unions in the U.S. because under federal labor law and actually most, uh, all, all state laws in which the collective bargaining is allowed, which is modeled on federal labor law, a union is obligated to uh, bargain on behalf of all the members of that bargaining unit, whether they're members of the union or not. So if workers can get the same benefits without having to pay for representation, it introduces what's been called the free rider problem. Certainly many conscientious workers would continue to pay dues uh, to the union if, uh, even if they weren't forced to pay agency fees. Um, but uh, it would be akin to making uh, government taxes voluntary, right? Um, if the state could not compel people to pay taxes, uh, the state would either have to, you know, the, the government would either have to do with much less or 
uh, charge the people who were willing to pay disproportionately more. So it's, a, it's an enormous problem. Now, since home health care workers have unionized in uh, Illinois, their hourly wages have increased about 50%. And there's another raise uh, on the way this year that's been bargained into the contract that will bring their, their uh, uh, wages up to about $13 an hour. So almost doubling wages in the, the course of just a few years. So why on earth would anyone be uh, willing to challenge such an arrangement, right, in which they've seen their uh, uh, wages increase dramatically over a short period of time in exchange for paying a, a, a small fee to the union for representing them? All right, well, this is uh, Pamela Harris uh, with her special needs son, uh, the uh, eponymous uh, challenger. And here's why she's challenging it. So I'm just going to show a quick... Uh, a quick clip. Now, this, let me just give a little bit of backstory. This this clip is produced by an organization called the Illinois Policy Institute, um, which is a. Well, let me just actually I have it in here, so I'll just read uh, from their website who they are. I'm quoting: uh, The Illinois Policy Institute is an independent research and education organization generating public policy solutions aimed at promoting personal freedom and prosperity in Illinois. Illinois Policy Action is an independent government watchdog advocating for the people of Illinois and working to turn free market ideas into law. And so that's the end of the quote. Um, they're not, they, they did write an, an amicus brief. They're not the one, the, the sort of primary group that's funding uh, the effort. I'll talk about them in a minute. But I, I think this is instructive because it shows us um, Pamela Harris's logic for challenging uh, the law. Petition the Supreme Court of the United States. Can you imagine? Mom from Illinois just wanted to understand her rights. I'm Pam Harris, and I live here in um, northern Illinois with my husband, Kevin and our son Josh. Josh will be 25 years old at the end of this month. He's um, our youngest child, our, our second child. And Josh has a rare genetic syndrome called Rubenstein TB syndrome. Josh's condition means he needs constant care. To help offset the cost of this care, the Harris family participates in a program in which families receive a monthly benefit from Medicaid. But in 2009, Illinois Governor Pat Quinn issued an executive order to unionize everyone in this program. That means parents like Pam would be forced to join a government union and to pay dues to this union out of Josh's monthly benefit check. Unions exist so that employers and employees can negotiate on more or less even terms. Pam Harris isn't an employee. She's a mom. She cares for her kid. That's her real motivation. That's what she's actually doing here. To treat her as a state employee and then have her unionized just doesn't make any sense for what she's actually doing. I have real fears about unionism in my home. It will interfere with Josh's care and it intrudes in our family. Not only would unionization compromise the care Pam provides for Josh, it also violates her rights to free speech. The First Amendment guarantees the right not to be forced to pay for political speech you disagree with. But that's what the state is making providers like Pam Harris do. They're forced to pay for a union to speak to the government on their behalf, even though they don't agree with the union. And that really turns the way our government is supposed to work on its head, because we're supposed to be able to speak to the government or petition our government ourselves, or we choose our representatives to speak on our behalf. But instead, Illinois is saying, we're allowed to choose the representative, choose the representative for you who will speak on your behalf. Can you see how incompatible the idea of unionism is in a family home, caring, providing care and support for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, this should not 
even be a question. The Policy Institute has filed an amicus brief with the United States Supreme Court on Pam's behalf. Okay, so I wanted to show that for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, there's, uh, I'll talk more about this later, but there's a really kind of interesting slippage in some of the terminology that they use. So if you notice really early on, uh, the video said she's going to be forced to pay dues to a union, which as we know isn't true. You're not actually paying dues. Um, uh, also, the idea that the state is picking who's speaking on behalf of workers is clearly not the case since a representation election has to take place. So uh, unions are democratically elected, right? It's not that the government's just picking someone to represent, right, like an agent or something. Um, but there's a couple of other, re other reasons I think this uh, is so instructive. Number one, the free speech argument, which we'll get to in a minute, so let's bracket that for a second. Second, the idea that what Pam Harris is doing is not work in caring for her son is a larger discussion about what we value as labor in this country. Um, but we'll save that for another time as well. The most interesting thing to me about this is the way that she frames the union in this clip. Right? She objects to having, I'm quoting, unionism in my home, argues that it, quote, intrudes in our family. Now, it's really fascinating to me because She's certainly not worried about the government intruding into her home when it provides the Medicaid funds that she would likely argue she's entitled to. But the idea that the government would have a compelling interest in doing anything other than just paying her is, is deemed an intrusion. And so this is the idea I'm really interested in exploring today. How does a narrative that a union, which has helped some of the poorest workers in the country almost double their salary in the span of four years, how is the, is the narrative that they're an intrusion and an imposition get so much currency? Okay. Um, and so to understand this, we have to look at, uh, at least to understand this in part, we have to look at who is really behind the lawsuit. And that's an organization called the National Right to Work Committee. Now, we'll get back to the Harris case in just a minute. If you don't know how it worked out, spoiler alert, the SEIU lost, but it's not as bad as it could have been. Um, but for now, I want to give some background on who the organization is who was bankrolling Harris's legal defense. Okay, so the National Right to Work Committee was born um, out of the Taft-Hartley Act, the 1947 revision to uh, you know, the sort of basis of private sector labor law in this country, the Wagner Act in 1935. Among a lot of the different things that Taft-Hartley did to hamstring labor unions in the U.S., maybe the most important thing was allowing st states to pass what were called right-to-work laws. Uh, these provisions were designed specifically to preclude organized labor from compelling workers to join unions as a condition of employment or even from contributing to the cost of representing workers. So basically states, states are free if they want to pass these laws that um, uh, keep um, organization uh, uh, joining a labor union from being a condition of employment or from even paying agency fees uh, for rep purposes of representation. The purpose of such a policy is clearly to diminish the power of unions by forcing them to bear representation costs out of proportion to what they actually do. And it's by and large worked. Uh, the states covered by right-to-work laws are traditionally those in the South and the West, I think, uh, places we might call the Sun Belt, uh, areas with much lower union density than those in the Midwest and on the East Coast. Uh, some of you probably know that Indiana and Michigan, two uh, states in which they're more traditionally um, uh, unionized than most states in the Sun Belt, just in the past few years have had uh, right-to-work laws passed through viciously uh, anti-union legislatures. But mostly it's, uh, at least traditionally, has been confined to these places in the Sun Belt. Now, this has not only weakened unions in the states that pass such laws, but unions in other states too, since lots of corporations have sought, sought to relocate in states uh, in which there are right to work laws. So this is the main reason, for example, that uh, much of the uh, auto industry now is concentrated in places like Tennessee and Mississippi, places that have right to work laws. And you may have, um, there was a really interesting discussion about this uh, back in uh, last winter when Volkswagen workers in, uh, outside of Chattanooga voted not to unionize even though Volkswagen wanted them to unionize. So it's mm -hmm. really, really interesting stuff. The National Right to Work Committee, though, where they come into this, um, they're founded in 1955 as a political advocacy group devoted to defending right to work laws where they exist and extending them into states where they don't exist. And uh, it really started to become a sort of major player in national politics 
uh, in the 1960s after a man named Reed Larson uh, became the executive director. So here's Reed Larson, and um, if, if, you, if you try to uh, Google and find a picture of Reed Larson, what you end up, this is like one of the first things that comes up. Uh, this is uh, an interview with him in the John Birch Society. Music <laughs> that gives you a sense of kind of where his images are. Um, you also get Reed Larson, the hockey player. I don't know if there's any hockey fans in here. Um, it's always interesting because I put together a lot of uh, you know, lectures, obviously, for classes I teach. And so I like to go down these sort of, this is what Google gave me, kind of uh, uh, tangents. Uh, anybody heard of Reed Larson before? Any big Red Wings fans in here? Okay. Well, Larson, um, according to his Wikipedia entry, was a tough offensive defenseman, particularly well known for his hard slap shot. Larson became the first American player to score 200 goals and appeared in the 1978, 80, and 1981 NHL All-Star Game as the Red Wings representative. So it's kind of an open question as to who is the more famous of the two Larsons. Mm -hmm. um, but the Larson we're interested in here, uh, this Reed Larson, um, as head of the NRTWC, lobbied assiduously for years um, to stop repeal of the right to work clause of Taft-Hartley. And actually, it came pretty close to being repealed in the mid-60s. Uh, it was only kept from being repealed by a Senate filibuster. And uh, Larson was pretty instrumental in sort of working behind the scenes to ensure that it, uh, that, that change to the law was filibustered. The group's biggest strategic innovation, however, was the creation in 1968 of its legal arm. Uh, and pay attention to the language here. The National Right to Work Legal Defense and Education Foundation which consciously modeled its tactics on the NAACP's efforts to fight segregation in the courts over much of the 20th century. The Legal Defense Foundation would use legal action to fight both the union shop, right, so where workers are compelled to join a union as a condition of employment, as well as, importantly, agency, the agency shop um, or fair share provisions. Now, even though Larson and other representatives of the group consistently argued that they were not anti-union, they just didn't want people to be forced to join unions, the fundamental core of the NRTWC's critique rested on the assertion that unions leveraged excessive power to stifle the freedom of employers, non-union employees, and consumers. So the kind of um, uh, uh, narrative that Pam Harris uh, believes and we saw expressed in the clip. What's interesting about this, though, is that the NRTWC strategy from the beginning of this Legal Defense Foundation effort uh, was to use a critique specifically of public sector unions to make a broader argument about labor unions in general. The very first legal defense case taken on by the NRTWC, in fact, was an effort by several teachers in Detroit, so this was about a decade before this Reed Larson joined the Red Wings, <laughs> uh, to strike down the agency shop provision of Michigan's public sector bargaining law. Let me give you a little background about now, I, I think I mentioned this yesterday. Um, teachers in Detroit, uh, who were uh, organized under an AFT affiliate, were one of the first big city teaching forces to get a contract in 1965. So uh, New York City was kind of the pioneer. Uh, Detroit and Philadelphia in 1965. We talked about Philadelphia yesterday. After winning an election as the sole bargaining agent of Detroit teachers, the DFT was able to get a contract only after passage of Michigan's new Public Employee Relations Act which was signed into law in 1965. Anybody know who the governor of Michigan was in 1965 who signed this into law? Dr. Romney. Romney. George Romney. And I, uh, I have a nice little image here. <laughs> Michigan teachers thank Governor Romney uh, for giving teachers the right to collectively bargain. Very different Republican Party. I think I've said that a couple of times already. Uh, the DFT then became the third major AFT local uh, to win an exclusive bargaining contract. All right? now, the Michigan law, this law that was signed into existence by Governor Romney, uh, allowed the DFT to bargain into its contract an agency shop provision. Same thing as it called agency shop at the time, fair share is the kind of preferred nomenclature now. And they did so in a contract signed in 1969. Immediately after the contract was signed, two teachers from Detroit, uh, uh, the first name uh, Christine Borshak, I think that's how it's pronounced, and the other Ernest Smith, formed a group called Teacher, Detroit Teachers Opposed to Compulsory Unionism and organized a legal challenge to the constitutionality of the agency shop provision. Whether the group was formed at the behest of the NRTWC is unclear. I, don't, I couldn't find evidence one way or another. Uh, 
But it seems highly unlikely that the legal, that the legal challenge would have gone very far without the backing of the NRTWC. Um, I found records that indicated that they contributed $100,000 to the legal effort um, within the first couple of years. Uh, as well as it's a, there was also uh, support by its Michigan affiliate, Michigan Citizens for the Right to Work. The, NR, the NRTWC, for its part, was eager to back the organization regardless because the organization was headed by two teachers, one of whom, Smith, was an African American and a former union organizer for the United Packing House Workers. So they could st sort of stake a claim to this, uh, to being as this grassroots organization of individuals fighting a civil rights campaign against a repressive bureaucratic union state apparatus. Indeed, the initial organizing efforts of DTOCU framed the issue in terms that fit within the strategic goals of the NRTWC's legal arm. So, uh, in a letter, so this is, this is right from the archive, in a letter from Christine Borshak, and if I'm pronouncing that wrong, please correct me, but uh, when you have too many consonants in a name, it's just hard for me to pronounce. Um, this was a, the, you know, one of the first newsletters. Uh, and you can see, um, I don't know how well you can read this, so I'll just uh, uh, talk a little bit about it here. Um, this was meant to basically attract more litigants for a class action lawsuit. And she attempted to place the effort in the context of 1960s social movements. So, um, Okay, well, I'll just read it. I think it actually got cut off when I zoomed in here. But uh, part of this um, newsletter said, um, and I'm quoting, no teacher should be forced to pay a union as a condition of employment. You and I should have the right to join or not join. That's what America is all about. We believe in civil rights. Isn't the right not to join a union a civil right? The school board, and this, is, this part's right here, uh, the school board, she argued, had gone along with the agency shop because, quote, a majority of the board are union-sponsored, union-backed, and union-financed as candidates. Now that they sit on the board, what other position would you expect? That's one of the great abuses in unionism today, the power to use money for politics. End quote. Uh, a press release issued by the other organizer, Ernest Smith, I'll show a picture of him in a second, uh, tied the issue more specifically to national politics and the unjust power of labor unions. So I'm quoting, this case has national implications. It is estimated that organized labor spent $60 million in the 1968 presidential campaign. Our question is this, should an individual be forced to contribute to such activities in order to hold a job, especially a government job such as teaching? End quote. It's doubtful though, uh, that most Detroit teachers, just like the domestic care workers in Illinois, believe they were victims of a unionization effort that had substantially raised their wages and brought them more workplace rights. Responses to the entreaties of the DTOCU, so like responses to this letter and a couple of other um, things that were given out to Detroit teachers. Um, the ones that remain in the archive seem to indicate the opposite, and I'll show you a couple of those. Clearly some teachers oppose the agency shop, since about 300, albeit out of a workforce of 12,000, signed onto the class action suit. Uh, but most, like, most likely did not oppose the union as pro-union teachers sent Smith and Warshak a scathing series of messages opposing the lawsuit. Um, here's a quote. Right. So here's a letter from the archive uh, from a woman named uh, Susan Kemp. She suggested, I don't know how we can read this, uh, that you could help the Detroit schools and teachers more by putting your time and money to purposes other than fighting a union that is working to improve education. The gains the union has made are worth many times the amount you're being asked to give to support uh, their operations. Uh, this letter uh, was written, I only have the first page, uh, but the second page, um, he or she basically signs it as a DFT member for over 20 years. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is when people still wrote in cursive. I don't know how many of us still know how to do that. Uh, I am not opposed to agency shop. I'm just tired of freeloaders like the members of your group <laughs> who are willing to accept all the benefits, raises, etc., but don't want to pay their fair share of the cost involved. No one should have to join any group that he doesn't want to, but also if everyone is benefiting, then it is only fair that everyone should pay the costs. Uh, finally, this one's pretty clever, although I found a few of these actually. I made the wrong thing. No. <laughs> 
so here you can see this mailer that's been totally defaced by a woman named Miriam Jaffe. Read the history of American unionism. You are so wrong in wasting your time. Too sad you're doing this. I found a few of these. Some of them use a bit more salty language. Uh, let's just say there were a few comparisons to Hitler um, and leave it at that. I can't repeat one of them that I'm thinking of. It's kind of funny, but we'll talk afterwards if you want to know. This. Off camera. Yeah. Um, the fact that most teachers did not feel oppressed by union dues or agency fees did not deter the organization, the D Detroit teachers opposed to compulsory unionism, from pressing their case further. After the case was defeated in Wayne County Court, the group took the case to the Michigan State Court in 1970. As the case worked its way through the Michigan court system and then the Federal Circuit Court from 1970 to 75, the NRTWC and its Michigan affiliate used the effort as the centerpiece of its fundraising and public relations campaigns. So this is a, 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 an example of the newsletter of the National Right to Work Committee. It's called Free Choice, the monthly roundup of labor news for employees who think for themselves. Um, in this issue, uh, they reported on the lawsuit, uh, prominently pointing out the DTOCU sought to overturn the public employee law because, quote, teachers are being deprived of their civil rights. The piece quoted Smith again, who framed the court strategy as one to determine whether, quote, Michigan teachers or any other public employee for that matter should be forced to underwrite the wide-ranging economic, political, and social schemes hatched by union professionals, end quote. Here's another example of this. This is the March, April 1970 issue. Uh, and there's Ernest Smith uh, pointing at the, the map uh, up there. Um, and he is, I don't know if you can see it here, but there's a, on, on the inside, uh, he's, there's another feature on him. He's called the worker of the issue. Um, and the story, you probably can't read it very well, uh, asserted that S Smith, quote, knows the value of a labor union. He also knows the threat the compulsory union shop poses to freedom. He advocates freedom for each individual to choose whether or not he wishes to join a particular union." The NRTWC also pu produced a publication called Right to Work Profiles, which attempted to show public employees fighting the excessive power of unions, hence trying to undercut unions' claim to workplace democracy, and also attempted to claim for the Right to Work movement the legacy of civil rights. So one of these uh, publications, which is a, a, you can tell somebody put some money into um, uh, producing it. It's glossy and very attractive looking. Um, so this one from 1963 featured a man named Jim Nixon. I think I have a picture of him, but yeah, there's Jim Nixon uh, in the lower left. <coughs> a board member of Michigan Citizens for the Right to Work. Nixon was, according to his profile, not only a former member of AFSCME, but also a civil rights activist. The profile lauded Nixon for, quote, persevering to get an education while admitting that it, quote, may have been harder for him as a black man. But then the feature continued. Someone stepped on his civil rights. Uh, so I'm not quoting, this is me now. Was the perpetrator one of the typical antagonists of the civil rights movement, like a racist white sheriff from the South? No, it was Democratic Mayor of Detroit, Jerome Cavanaugh, who had signed an agreement in 1969 with a local AFSCME affiliate requiring city employees to pay an agency fee for their bargaining representative. The piece concluded that his efforts to have the agency shop declared unconstitutional in Michigan represented the next logical step for the civil rights movement. And so quoting, as someone who for years has been greatly concerned with civil rights, Jim makes it plain that he not only speaks as a black man, but as a human being, an American, who's very interested in rights and freedoms for all Americans." Quote. These publications from the early 1970s are significant, not so much because of how many working people they reached. Right? You can imagine that a lot of Detroit teachers, um, uh, when being presented with some of these publications, uh, happy with their salary increases and improved working conditions, would have just not paid very much attention to it, as indicated from some of the responses. Uh, that they got. Um, one can also see that some of the strategies, like attempting to gain African American adherence by tying the Detroit agency shop case to the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. really didn't go anywhere. These, eff these efforts, though, I argue, are important for two reasons. First, the material was aimed specifically at working people, right? It, it wasn't 
aim to get uh, wealthy people who didn't like tax increases to, to give more money, right? It was designed to sort of build working class support. And, and, um, uh, and second, it actively attempted to reconfigure the very historical narrative of the labor movement in the United States. So when the anonymous reader to Smith's entreaty to join the lawsuit told him uh, to, quote, read the history of American unionism, uh, she understood that without some form of organization, and indeed some limited degree of compulsion, most American workers, teachers included, would have continued to toil for low wages, limited job security, and few workplace protections. The NRTWC profiles of anti-union workers highlight the emergence in the 1970s of a wide-scale political strategy on the right of forging the interests of beleaguered working people with economic conservatives against a union and government bureaucracy supposedly intent on limiting the freedom of the individual. The NRTWC narrative of compulsory unionism evidenced an inchoate version which would grow louder and more persuasive as the decade went on. Um, so just to let you know that this wasn't uh, just in these like, you know, sort of fringy uh, publications. Arch conservative entertainment magazine Reader's Digest, aside from just being that weird magazine hovering in your grandparents' basement, <laughs> uh, did its best to popularize this narrative in the mid-1970s. So believe it or not, you can find an image of uh, pretty much any um, um, issue of Reader's Digest you want on, online, even if it's not the best. This is the best one I could find. I like the eagle uh, in the background. It's, it's really pretty sweet. Um, but this is from the November 1975 edition. And this edition, Inside, featured an article about a Detroit teacher who was part of the class action suit, which was soon to be heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. The woman's name was Ann Parks, and according to the story, she had been a teacher for 30 years in the Detroit public school system, but had received a termination notice in 1970, which the article only pointed out several paragraphs later had been almost immediately rescinded, uh, for refusing to pay agency fees. This injustice, according to the article, was of the utmost consequence for, quote, everyone concerned with preserving basic freedoms in America. The article skewered the Detroit Federation of Te Teachers for forcing parks to pay dues to the union for bargaining, which, as we know, they didn't have to pay dues. So this is a long-standing long sort of effort uh, to interchange those terms. Uh, Parks' effort was not framed as a refusal to contribute for the dramatic salary increases she had received, uh, as a result of collective bargaining. Instead, the article attempted to explain her courage in joining the legal challenge by referencing her, quote, hard work and self-reliance and the, quote, mountain spirit she took away from a childhood spent in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. The piece concluded by leaving the courts with a stark choice. So I'm quoting, now it's up to our judiciary to decide whether Ann Parks and uncounted others must join and finance teachers' associations and unions in order to continue teaching. Now, that such a narrative articulated in Reader's Digest represented an important political intervention seems evident as a result of the fact that the magazine was the highest circulating periodical in the 1970s, right? So it was, it was widely read. Um, something like, in certain uh, regions of the country, something like 25%, like the people of the Northeast, like subscribe to Reader's Digest, based on research that I've come across. Um, anybody know what the highest circulating periodical would have been in the 1970s? Nope. Life? Nope. Think about something that people have to do in the 1970s to watch TV that they don't now. TV Guide. TV Guide. TV guide. Totally ubiquitous. You might remember the uh, 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 George Costanza's father's fetish for uh, uh, TV Guide and Seinfeld. Um, so, okay, so, right, uh, people understood how important Reader's Digest was. Or, yeah, Reader's Digest. Um, Albert Shanker, who took over the AFT presidency in 1974, he clearly understood the ramifications as he wrote personally to the magazine's managing editor after the article came out. Shanker took issue with the piece's calculated misrepresentation, his words, that Parks had been forced to pay dues to the union. Rather, an agency ser service fee, he argues, I'm quoting, was a kind of tax levied for services rendered whether the employee requests the services or not. In this case, I'm sure Ann Parks would not deny that the services of the Detroit Federation of Teachers have produced substantial material gains and improved working conditions for her in the years since 1964." End quote. Shanker went on to point out that the pieces writer had disingenuously used uh, dues and fees interchangeably and questioned whether 
uh, the magazine had consciously tried to further the agenda of the NRTWC. Uh, this piece, Shanker could have also pointed out, uh, if he wanted to, uh, was just one of many pieces in Reader's Digest in the 1970s that featured exposés of union pension scandals, blamed public sector unions for bankrupting New York City, comparing uh, uh, U.S. Uh, teachers unions in the United States to labor in Britain and making the argument that the United States economy would collapse because uh, their labor unions were too powerful, and theorized that the NEA and AFT were threatening to destroy the U.S. education system. All right. Now, by 1976, after both the state of Michigan and the U.S. Circuit Court had upheld agency fees, the, court went to the, the case went to the Supreme Court. The court at the time was made up of six Republican appointees, and they held oral arguments in November 1976, issuing a judgment in, in uh, May 77. In a unanimous decision of a court of six Republican appointees, the decision was written by Potter Stewart, uh, SCOTUS held that the agency shop did not violate the rights of Detroit teachers. Building on case law for private sector unions, the court asserted that an exclusive bargaining agent was just as important for public sector unions as, quote, the desirability of labor peace is no less important in the public sector, nor is the risk of free riders any smaller, end quote. Further, while the goals of public sector work, that is, uh, providing services to citizens, may have differed from the private sector, right, so making a profit, so I'm quoting from the decision again, public employees are not basically different from private employees. On the whole, they have the same sort of skills, the same needs, and seek the same advantages, end quote. There was a powerful limitation to agency fees, however, which would set a significant uh, precedent. And um, the, one of the readings I assigned, for those of you who are going to come to the informal seminar, deals with uh, how uh, this argument sort of, uh, deals a bit more with this argument, so you might consider reading that if you want to talk further about this. Um, the court upheld a lower court's ruling that any fees that were spent on explicitly political speech, like campaigning for candidates or ballot propositions, had to be refunded to workers if they were not union members. So if they opted out of the union, uh, any, any fees that had been spent on that had to be refunded. All right? Um, so this was, this was the decision that was the relevant precedent uh, to Harris. Uh, it's called the Abud versus Detroit Board of Education from 1977. Okay, so uh, in spite of this limitation, the decision really uh, largely meant a defeat for the DTOCU and the NRTWC. The constitutionality of the agency shop was upheld for public sector unions, as the court ruled that the National Right to Work Committee's argument about workers' First Amendment rights did not outweigh the state's compelling interest in upholding labor peace. And the court also argued that the minority of those covered by collective bargaining agreements who did not want to join a union, and by definition, it's always a minority, we should remember, since unions only come to be certified when there's a democratic election, had other avenues to express themselves, right? So if, if if the union is doing something that you don't like, there, you have other First Amendment outlets to ex, you know, express yourself. Still, even though they saw their challenge defeated after over eight years of legal wrangling, the effort was not fruitless. These groups had brought to the national consciousness, not only through its legal case, but through the NRTWC's fundraising efforts, as well as efforts in Reader's Digest to popularize it, uh, the narrative that labor unions, especially in the public sector, were not there to protect workers and promote democracy, but rather served as stifling bureaucracies that trampled workers' rights and threatened the public interest. The real freedom fighters in this narrative were lonely pioneering activists like Ernest Smith and Ann Parks, toiling against an oppressive system. This narrative would be used to explain all sorts of crises in the 1970s, the New York City fiscal crisis, double-digit inflation, even fears exacerbated by the oil shocks in 1973 and 79 that the U.S. was losing its preeminent place in the world. And so, I think most of us know the story of how this narrative has only grown in stature in the past few decades, and has allowed for the continuous erosion of first private sector unions, and even more recently, attacks against the, the strongest place left in the American labor movement, the public sector in states like Michigan and Wisconsin and Ohio. So it was really in this kind of climate that the NRTWC tried again in 2013 to deal what it might not be overstating things to call a death blow to organized labor in the United States. Maybe the only place left, and we can debate this, but maybe the only place left of real strength in the American labor movement today is public sector workers in heavily unionized states. 
Almost 40% of public sector workers in the U.S. currently belong to unions, while for the private sector, the number has dropped below 7%. Most of the states with fair share provisions have the nation's largest public employee union memberships. New York, for example, in which workers must pay agency fees, as of 2009, had the highest public sector unionization rate in the country, around 75%. It's not an understatement to argue that the consequences for public sector unions, if the court were to broadly invalidate agency fees, would be monumental. And we've already seen sort of how this has worked out in Wisconsin, so I'm sure many of you know this story better than me. But maybe even more importantly, we now also have the most anti-union court since World War II. In a study published last April in the Minnesota Law Review, some of you may have heard of this already, the Roberts Court was declared the most pro-business court since the war. And Justice Samuel Alito, the single most pro-business justice over the last three quarters of a century. Now, of course, the composition of the court both reflects and drives the nation's political ideology. So it's not a surprise, given the developments I talk, discussed in my talk yesterday, that the court has moved so far right. But the court practically begged for a deeper challenge to agency fees in a decision released in, 20, in 2012, a five to four majority authored by Alito, called Knox versus SEIU, which asserted that a policy that forces public workers to opt out of monies used for overtly political speech, quote, represents a remarkable boon for unions, creating a risk that the fees non-members pay will be used to further political and ideolo ideological ends with which they do not agree, end quote. So ba basically asking someone to further challenge the abode precedent. In backing Harris and the seven other home care workers, the NRTWC then pushed the free speech argument even further than it had back in 1977. Uh, so the NRTWC's um, attorney, William Messenger, arguing the case in front of the Supreme Court in oral arguments in January, asserted that public sector unions of any kind, uh, public sector activities, union activities of any kind, because they involve workers employed by the government, are inherently political, and thus any contributions by those like Harris who disagree are violations of free speech. This logic isn't necessarily flawed in the sense that public sector unions do, by their very nature, agitate for things like wages, benefits, and working conditions that represent public policy. Of course, we might also point out that a good deal of money spent on corporate free speech that agitates against policies such as minimum wages, progressive taxation, or employer-sponsored access to birth control comes from the contributions of workers who are not likely to agree with it. Corporations clearly profit from the labor of their, of their workers. If they, if they don't, they're bad corporations. Um, it's just, they just are. Uh, and thus, just by their definition. And thus, any corporate funds used to support political speech from people who are likely to dis... Um, uh, any corporate funds that are used to support political speech uh, uh, from people who are likely to disagree with that speech is a violation of that person's free speech. But uh, I don't think we're going to see the Supreme Court rule anytime soon that corporations have to rebate those funds to workers who opt out of such a system. I find it a terrible irony, in fact, to even have a conversation in which the basic premise is that the employee should have more free speech rights toward the union that is invested in representing them than toward an employer whose sole concern is to profit from renting their bodies. Mm -hmm. But here we are. And um, uh, when the decision was released last June 30th, it was a bad sign that the justice writing the decision for the majority was Samuel Alito. Now the problem for Alito, and by the way, there's a lot of buildup to this. Uh, again, for those of you who read SCOTUS blog, they, they try to figure out which justices are going to be writing which decision based on who hasn't uh, you know, done one in a while. And so it was coming down to the last day, and it was pretty clear that Alito was going to be writing one of the last two. And he was like, oh god, which one is he going to write? Um, the problem for Alito, however, was the judicial principle of stare decisis. Short of some major kind of social change, the court's legitimacy in part rests on the fact that it doesn't constantly overrule itself every time it gets new members. It's clear from the decision that if Alito had a magic wand, and thankfully he doesn't, at least that I know of, he would have ruled that representation calls for unions should always be voluntary. But the only thing that's really substantively changed with regard to public sector unions since Abood in 1977 is the nation's overarching political ideology. So um, whether to uphold the legitimacy of the court or just to get the five votes necessary uh, for the decision, Alito's opinion did not go so far as to rule all agency fees unconstitutional. 
Instead, what he did, and it's, it's really brilliant, um, if that's what you want to call it, is to spend about half of the decision describing all of the flaws with the Abood precedent and uh, undermining the logic of public sector uh, labor unions, thus agreeing with the NRTWC's logic and setting up further challenges down the road. And then to assert that because it's such a flawed precedent, uh, the court could not extend the, the agency fee agreement to home care workers because they're not, uh, as the decision says, they're not actually workers. They, they're not actually government employees in the way that, uh, say, a teacher is. Okay, so here's the language. Because of Abood's questionable foundations, I'm going to skip. If we allowed Abood to be extended to those who are not full-fledged public employees, it would be hard to see just where to draw the line. And we therefore confine Abood's reach to full-fledged <laughs> employees. Now, this part of the ruling is not so interesting to me. Alito argues in the majority decision that home care workers are not directly employed by the state. He says they're instead employed by their clients, and that they can also be uh, directly hired or fired by their, by their client. So they're not direct employees of the state, he says. But as Justice Elena Kagan pointed out in her dissent, the state ultimately pays for the labor, sets qualifications for employment, and can effectively fire home care workers by just refusing to reimburse them for Medicaid costs. So Alito is quite likely wrong um, about them being workers. Mm -hmm. But the more interesting part of the decision is uh, threefold. First, there's the nakedness with which the decision links public sector unionization to the growth of the welfare state, clearly seeking to diminish both in tandem. And so here's that language. And he spends a, a sizable portion of the decision uh, talking about how this is an even more pressing problem now because of the amount of money we spend on Medicaid, because of the amount of money we spend on, on social welfare programs. So social welfare and living wages for home care workers represent significant policy problems because the state is forced to spend money on them, right? Second, what I, what I think is uh, instructive is Alito's intellectual effort to undermine any kind of common sense support for unionization and instead furthering the notion that a union is simply a collection of individual agents, like a, a, a club or a buyer's cooperative or something. That a union doesn't actually need contributions from all of its members to function effectively. Let's get that. Right? So he says, a union's status as exclusive exclusive bargaining agent and the right to collect an agency fee from non-members are not inex inextricably linked. Hmm. Finally, the language of Alito's decision lends legitimacy to the NRWC narrative that unions are engaged in anti-democratic, anti-worker action. So for example, Alito's decision uses the word scheme seven times, right? And so this is just one example. Features of the Illinois scheme would still undermine the argument that the agency fee, uh, you get the idea. This is a uh, whether conscious or not, uh, a direct appropriation of the National Right to Work Committee's language around uh, agency fees. So this is from an NRTWC newsletter around the same time, it's posted on their website, and I just bolded every single place that used the word scheme, similar scheme, by the, by the bottom it's a constant, constitutionally dubious scheme. Here's the definition of scheme from uh, dictionary.com. Um, <laughs> They both, so they use this term that, as you can see from definition number one, does have a kind of generic meaning, but the connotation of scheme also has that sort of second meaning, that it's an underhanded plot or some kind of entry. And um, so it may or may not be intentional, but it's, it's a great example of kind of how language around union organizing can kind of shape political consciousness. So it seems pretty clear that the free market majority on the court to be generous, either doesn't understand why collective organization for workers is important, that is, why unions aren't just another interest group out there, or for ideological reasons, they just don't want unions to, to collectively bargain uh, in order to circumvent the logic of the market. Whatever the case, it, it's clear to me uh, that eliminating compulsory agency fees is not the end game for free market activists in the US. And to prove it, all we have to do is look at the National Right to Work Committee's next move following the Harris decision. Now remember, this is an organization that for the better part of half a century said, we're not against unionization, right? Unionization's fine as long as no one's forced to join or forced to pay anything toward a union. 
But guess what the NRTWC is, go, is doing now? Over the summer, home care workers in the state next door, you know, uh, you know the one, they've got a bad football team but progressive politics, Minnesota, uh, voted the SEIU in as their representative. This was on the heels of the Harris decision, so the SEIU announced they would not seek any form of agency fees, that they would represent all workers as they're legally required and rely on voluntary dues for the cost of representation. Now, the NRTWC should have been elated, right? This is what we've wanted for 60 years. We want organizations not to force anyone to join them. Um, they were not elated. Um, <laughs> oh, they cut to the chase. I'm going to skip the stuff on the Kagan's descent. We can talk about that if you want. But I wanted to show this real quick. Um, the NRTWC is now contesting the certification election uh, in Minnesota, calling the, uh, calling the election uh, the, quote, tyranny of a small minority, end quote, because voter turnout was deemed too low, right? So you can see the language here quoted in the Minneapolis Star Tribune over the summer. And yet, no one's really laughing off such a challenge, even though such a principle would basically invalidate the election of every congressperson who's elected uh, in an off-year election, and maybe some that are uh, in presidential elections. It would be like, say, invalidating the election of Senator Ron Johnson, who was elected to the Senate in 2010 with about 1.1 million votes out of 4.3 million eligible voters. Of course, we don't call that the tyranny of a majority, right? The point here is that those who oppose unions in the U.S., either for ideological reasons or just because they have an interest in having access to cheap, desperate workers, will not stop. Okay, it's kind of like the, ter the Terminator in those you know, uh, James Cameron movies. They will not stop until the market is the only logic undergirding every aspect of life. They will not stop until every form of collective organization, workplace protection, and wage floor is gone in the United States and the rest of the world. There's a lot of discussion in today's politics about class warfare, and the term is typically used as an epithet against anyone who favors the most minute level of income redistribution or workplace organization. But the real class warfare is perpetrated by those who already wield economic power. The real class warfare is by those who push for a greater and greater presence of the market. They desire competition because they want to compete in a marketplace in which the deck is dramatically stacked in their favor. Who wouldn't? I always cheated my sister at Monopoly when she was younger. I had a great time uh, doing that because the, the odds were stacked in my favor. Don't play Monopoly against me and let me be the banker. <laughs> But I think there's a sense, just to kind of conclude, I think there's a real sense in this nation that the labor movement is somehow at a low point and has nowhere to go but up. But I think as the history of the National Right to Work Committee's efforts show us, this is erroneous. If we want to build a more democratic economy and a more democratic workplace, we have to rebuild social solidarities, not based on convenience or temporary political expedience. We have to understand that market logic has done and continues to do major violence against almost all of us. And we have to develop both the institutions and the vocabulary to develop a real response. Only then will we be able to defend ourselves from the real class warfare that's been perpetrated in this country and the world over the last half century. All right, so. so I tried to end a little bit earlier today so we have time for more questions and discussion. You have until 5.30. I, uh, I'm curious about something. So, you know, at the beginning of your, your talk, you um, mentioned how these early efforts in the 70s were directed at working people, and it was an attempt to sort of um, shape the views of working people. And, and you were saying it seems from the available evidence that it didn't have much effect, that uh, uh, there, there wasn't a groundswell of support for uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, and then in the rest of your talk, you moved on um, to the courts. And I'm, so I'm wondering if, uh, what you meant to suggest is that the effort to shape public opinion uh, became really secondary uh, to reshaping um, the opinions of, of judges and, and sort of the legal process, or whether you see a continuation of um, the efforts to shape public opinion alongside those legal efforts. And have you, have you looked at um, public opinion polling or other sources of data that could 
shed light on uh, shifts in public opinion over time. So sort of wondering about the relationship between public opinion and then what's going on with, with courts and, and elites uh, in terms of the legal process. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And um, the point I was making about um, sort of working people not being too engaged with that was that that's, that's specific to the early 1970s. I think by the time we get to the end of the 1970s, you see a lot more, um, uh, a lot more sort of uh, working class buy-in, right? So, I mean, for example, uh, you know, just take the presidential elections of 1980 and 84. Uh, something like 48% of union households voted for Reagan in 1980. And you could say, okay, great. Um, you know, people were just pissed off because Carter was such a you know, lousy president or whatever. Uh, but then you got an even larger percentage of that in 1984 after smashing Patkin, right? So by 1984, union uh, households knew uh, what Reagan's policies were. It wasn't anymore like, well, this is just a referendum on Carter. So I think, especially when you in the late 70s and early 80s, you do see a lot more buy-in. Um, in terms of public opinion polls, uh, public opinion polls reflect that. Uh, so Gallup does these polls um, where they ask the same questions over and over, like for it's basically longitudinal. And um, uh, so they ask these questions in general: Do you approve or disapprove of labor unions? The sort of high water mark for labor unions is 1965, when you have like. Don't, don't quote me on the specific number, but something like 75% of the population in general approving. By the time you get to the end of the 1970s, uh, you have, uh, those, those numbers are down to just over 50%, but the important part of that that, that I think is relevant by like 1979, 80, before we even get to like the PATCO strike, uh, is that you then have 35, 40% of the population saying they disapprove, right? So, you know, a, a, that's a pretty substantial swing over a fairly short period of time. Now, Chad, the other question about um, uh, elites, uh, you know, public opinion versus the courts, I don't, I don't think it's really dichotomous. I think actually um, both, of those, both of those two elements uh, were very much working in tandem. So it was like, okay, we're going to do this in the courts, right, but at the same time we're going to use that to um, uh, try and sway public opinion as well, right, which is where you see the reporting, you know, pop up in places like Reader's Digest, right, where lots and lots of people are going to be um, now I think there are moments, uh, also other really sort of interesting places where the two coincide. So uh, if I had more time, when I wrote the original draft of this, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, the Labor Reform Act of 1978, because the NRTWC, as well as a number of other organizations, um, uh, some of the organizations Patrick we were talking about yesterday, like the Business Roundtable, uh, worked really heavily to get that to get that law filibustered. But the way they did that was by um, uh, uh, sort of attempted a grassroots campaign to get people to call their senators in swing states. So in places like Florida and Arizona where you had either liberal Republicans or you know, Democrats who were, Southern Democrats who were still sort of holding on to you know, the tradition of the Democratic Party, they, 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 spent a, an, an, they outspent labor unions something like eight or nine to one um, just sending out mailers, um, ha having um, uh, uh, letters to the editor published in these tiny um, uh, towns to try and sway public opinion, and then, you know, the, the sort of buy-in was now call your senator and tell them to vote against that, and it worked. It fell two votes short of of, uh, um, of breaking filibuster. And they spent more money on lobbying too. That's right. Oh, absolutely. A uh, ton of a uh, ton more money on lobbying. Absolutely. Yeah. Would you would you introduce yourself? Because I just like to. Uh, Bob Rushline. How are you doing, Dr. Bob Rushline? Uh, peace economics is my main thing. Um, but I sort of come up with three questions. One is, uh, you know, the, the the author of Who Sold the American Dream points back to the '71 Powell memo, and maybe you can talk about that and that role. And another thing is. Um, Racism. Just is there any racism in this process? I mean, we know when Social Security was passed, uh, it exempted uh, farm and, and household because basically racism, you know, is to, to get the Deep South senators on board. So, so I'm wondering if, if, what role that has played in this whole narrative. And uh, the third thing uh, I just heard recently. Uh, the idea that 
that uh, labor unions were more connected to uh, the people they represented and more indigenous, if you will, you know, like the difference between a mercenary army and an indigenous army or something, and, and that now uh, they're kind of in it for the paycheck or uh, to, to want to maintain the union, uh, some of the leadership, I mean, and, and not as involved with the actual members in a more democratic process that brings the whole union along. Uh, you know, you get the idea. So now, those three three concepts. But now you mean the present, or you mean the seventies? Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, it, uh, over time that that has has kind of evolved that way. That that maybe uh, when unions were started, it was more of a grassroots thing and solidarity thing, and maybe today it's more of a uh, they're just hanging on and they're not really evangelizing or, or uh, uh, getting involved with the membership and just getting a vote and getting a paycheck and, and, uh, uh, and not doing a whole lot of grassroots activity with their membership. Okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's take that one and work backwards. Okay. All right, so um, the answer is yes, basically. I mean, I think um, that, that was a major criticism uh, of unions even in the 1970s is that uh, especially um, private sector unions because they had been, uh, they had had bargaining contracts for such a long time that they were somehow not responsive to their members anymore. Uh, there's, there's definitely kind of um, uh, evidence of this narrative in popular culture. I'm thinking of, uh, what's the name of that movie with Harvey Keitel and Richard Pryor from like 1978, uh, Blue Collar, right? That, that uh, somehow it's, uh, un it's union leadership that are sort of uh, anti-democratic and are in large part responsible for the plight of working people in the 70s. Um, and I think uh, something like agency fees, uh, you know, Charles and I were talking about this earlier um, today, um, I think has been a wake-up call for, for losing agency fees, uh, has been a wake-up call for unions that they have to be more responsive um, to their to their members, that there has to be organiz organization. That when when somebody uh, um, uh, let's just say gets a job at a at a, a K twelve school, right? That instead of just you know being automatically signed up into the union and not even having anybody maybe talk to them, that now that's got to happen, right? Because uh, uh, people aren't automatically in the union; they're not automatically paying uh, agency fees or anything. So if you want them to pay for the cost of representation, you have to have those kinds. So I think, um, is there a like, Chinese proverb that like this, the symbol for a crisis is the same symbol for opportunity? And I think that's definitely the case now. It's a much harder road. It's much more difficult to organize without agency fees, but it also opens an opportunity to create more democratic unions. And I think uh, what's, what happened with the CTU uh, you know, is, a, is a great example of that, right? Like turning over the, the, and winning a really improbable election, actually which is, you know, in some ways, why the news about Karen Lewis is, I think, is so devastating, and we hope that she goes through. But, um, so, yeah, I think that's a major part of the story. All right, race. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I could have talked about here is that maybe that's the other piece of how, um, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, the right is able to kind of mobilize white working class against um, you know, against the Democratic coalition in some ways. Um, so, absolutely, I could have talked about that. And especially, you have a lot of language in the 1970s about um, uh, sort of, I'm thinking in particular some of the work I do in the New York City fiscal crisis, right? There's a discussion during the fiscal crisis that what's ruined New York City is welfare recipients and, and public sector unions. And there's somehow sort of, uh, um, discursively, you know, linked together, that they're both like uh, leeches on the city, right, and the productive people are the ones out there in the workforce, and, the, and they're the ones being, you know, screwed over, right? So I think, absolutely, and, and, and welfare, uh, uh, welfare is very much racialized by the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. in the United States. So I think it's absolutely part of uh, the story. What was your other question? <laughs>
Powell memo. Powell memo. Um, um, the only thing, you know, the only thing I can say about the Powell memo is uh, that uh, the Powell memo was largely responsible for the galvanization, uh, the political galvanization of groups like uh, the Chamber of Commerce, right, which was who Powell wrote the memo for. Um, and that memo, I think, is, if I remember correctly, is essentially the reason that Nixon uh, elevated him to the Supreme Court, right? It's the, sort of a, an affirmation of, of that idea. <coughs> so hopefully that answers your questions, to the extent that I have answers. Yeah, would, and would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Keith Hintz. Hi. Is uh, collective collective bargaining at the governmental level a privilege or a right? Um, are you asking if I believe that or? Yes. Um, I think, uh, like anyone who works, um, you know, workers should have the right to, to you know organize and have a collective voice. And I think, um, you know, there were in the in the seventies in particular, uh, just since I'm thinking about it, um, uh, there was a law that almost ex there was a, a, a bill in Congress that almost extended uh, private sector rights to public employees uh, in 1974. And uh, Joseph McCartan writes about this uh, labor historian uh, quite quite eloquently about the uh, the attempt to basically, you know combination of public sector strikes and the downturn in the economy basically keep it from happening. Yeah. So I'm Charles. I'm a union organizer, so the National Rights Work people warned you about me. Um, I have a couple questions about the Detroit context. Like I think it's really interesting uh, what you did. Yesterday you talked about Philadelphia and today Detroit, but 69 is also kind of the peak of the rebellion of the black workers in the auto plants, directed mostly against the mostly white leadership of the UAW. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you have any connections to draw between what's happening in that union and uh, Smith being one of the, the front people for the National Right to Work Committee within the DFT. Um, the other thing about that is something about the Detroit Education Association got cut off in um, Warzik's quote, but oh, really? it was, it, I saw that she mentioned it, but there was something in there about, and it was, I think, directed against exclusive representation, but, this one? yeah, it seems like she's trying to say that, you know, it seems like she's trying to make an argument against exclusive represent, representation, and um, I guess a big part of, you know, what the precedence and Abood has to say is that the state has an interest in exclusive representation yeah. dealing with a single bargaining agent. Yeah. And like, do you see, like with that starting to be chipped away, do you see like a change in the point of view, at least in public sector bargaining about exclusive representation? Because the way I look at it, I mean, US labor law is based on that principle. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like there's incompatible kind of arguments being made between get, doing away with agency fee, but also the history of exclusive representation in this country. So was the DEA an advocacy organization at that point, not a collective bargaining? No, they were competing with the NEA. Yeah, they were going for representation. Yeah. Um, okay, so clarify for me, what's what's the what's the competing argument? Well, there's, I mean, there's just a principle in American labor law about exclusive representation. And so doing away with agency fee, which is kind of the flip side of the principle that you have to represent all workers. Like, do you see any changing the point of view in public sector employers with regard to exclusive representation? I, I haven't seen that. I mean, not, not in the not in the 70s of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I think there are people on the really far right who are making, like libertarians who are making that argument. So uh, again, one of the, the readings I assigned um, is about the career of Sylvester Petro, who uh, is a libertarian, um, he's, a, he's a, a law professor. And um, you know he makes he makes the argument that unions are, unions are fine, but you know collective bargaining in and of itself is a problem, right? Uh, you shouldn't recognize any kind of you know they, that they should basically be kind of like just other kind of interest groups. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and he actually did uh, 
you know, write a brief uh, for uh, the Abu case. So, you know, there's that there's that idea out there, uh, but I don't I don't know how many people are really sort of going that far. I mean, I, I think the idea of of, uh, of an exclusive representative is, is not really being challenged so much. Mm -hmm. I, I could be wrong about that. It's an interesting question. Um, and the other question was UAW. UAW. Um, I, I, that I don't know. Um, so you're talking about like the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement and that stuff. Um, er, the, the Ernest Smith stuff was really interesting because I was at the uh, Ruther archives, which if anybody wants to do any kind of uh, archival research on uh, the AFT, it's the place to go. Um, Dan Gladner there is a fabulous archivist, so get in touch with him. Um, so I was there for a I think maybe three or four days. And, and the last day I was there, he was like, look, I got this stuff. You might be interested in it, basically. It was, how it, it was unprocessed stuff. And it was the Ernest Smith uh, papers, which is really where most of the archival stuff for this comes from. And what's fascinating about it is you find all these memos, uh, all these documents. And then I got to like the last, um, maybe like one of the last couple of folders. And that was the first time I'd seen a picture of Smith. And it was the first time I realized he was black. So it was it was really really interesting. It's like how does this you know uh, what what's going on here? Um, and I, I don't I, you know all I know is kind of what's in the in the um, the archives about Smith. I didn't find anything to, to suggest that he was connected to any of that. I mean, it's your intuition's really interesting there. Um, but it but it seemed like uh, he did have. I think he ended up actually suing uh, the Detroit. Uh, school board um, for a civil rights violation. Uh, he, he felt that he was fired unjustly on, because of his race, so that's how that kind of kind of ends up. So I'm not sure exactly what to make of him. If it's you know just kind of a, an isolated individual or, or or what, but no, I, I didn't see any specific connections to that. But your intuition is really interesting. Yeah, what, what's your name? Michael. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I had a question about uh, some of the rhetoric around. Um, Opposing teachers' unions that was coming from the National Rights Work Committee. So uh, most of it centered around um, how the union oppresses sort of the, the pioneering individuals, et cetera, et cetera. You, you sort of had a throwaway comment about uh, there was somewhere, maybe in the Reader's Digest article, a point about um, the way that teachers' unions were destroying public education. Uh -huh. That's something you hear all the time now. Yep. Um, I, w I wondered if you could say a little bit more about what that rhetoric was like. Uh, I'm curious in particular, um, I mean, the first thing I thought of was the Ocean Hill-Brownsville uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. strike and um, the kinds of arguments that, that were generated around that time. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, if you could just say more a little bit about, about what the argument was there. Yeah, and so in particular, um, and you know, some of the Right to Work pu publications uh, delve into this a bit more. Thanks for coming. Uh, delve into this a bit more. Um, in particular, uh, there's even a, a connection to pedagogy, right? So um, the idea is, if you have these teachers who belong to unions, they're not going to be able. You see the the logic represented right here: uh, employees who think for themselves. It, it, it's, it, in some ways, it's almost um, uh, uh, reminiscent of sort of language around communism and, and dupes. You know that if these people are members of unions. And they're just going to sort of teach the party line, right? They're not going to think for themselves and, and teach students about, you know, good old-fashioned American stuff like freedom, right? Because because all because all they care about is all they care about is is their wages and whatever the union basically tells them to do, right? It, there's this whole thing about um, uh, you know kind of entrepreneurialism, which is kind of ironic actually, given where stuff like the Common Core, which like it or not, it's taken us in this direction of like sort of more uniform kind of curriculum. Um, so uh, that's that's sort of one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is budgets, right? So if you're spending all this money on teacher salaries, you're not going to have enough money for supplies, and you're not going to have enough money for administrator salaries. You're not going to have enough money to do like experimental programs. Even though actually uh, the AFT was uh, an advocate of some really interesting experimental programs in the late 60s and 70s, stuff like more effective schools, and actually, some of you may not know this, but Albert Shanker was uh, 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 basically sort of uh, sort of uh, one of the two sort of like parallel people who came up with the idea for charter schools, right? That 
you, but he saw it as something that the union could work with, right? That you get, uh, get a small group of teachers uh, in charge of the schools, and they can basically experiment with all these different kinds of techniques. By the end of his life, he sort of argued that, well, this is going in some directions that we're not going to like. But that's the kind of stuff that I think um, you know, can come out of uh, sort of a weird irony that, come, that came out of unionization. But the idea was that you know, if you're just focused on your salaries, then you know, all these kind of new pedagogical techniques, we're not going to have money to do those kinds of things. So I think it's, I think it's both of those. I'm wondering how, is, um, how we should read, read gender in all of this, John, especially in light of the Harris Quinn decision when you see the, the next, you know, after public sector employees who are, the, the, the talk that you gave yesterday was incredibly convincing at how teachers bear the brunt of any attack on public sector employees because of the sheer density that they represent, which is a, you know, a feminized workforce, and now Harris Quinn with healthcare workers, um, and the, you know the second point that you made, which you know didn't get addressed in this talk, just the idea of care work is not work, and how that's a there's a there's a lot of how talk us through that a little bit. Yeah. So um, I don't know. That's not a question. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. I, you know, and, and, and I, I think I mean I think gender is enormously important. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, teacher unions is that you have these largely feminized workforces uh, in which there are mostly male uh, leaders, uh, which is actually the case with you know, a lot of uh, unionized workforces that are predominantly female. I'm thinking about garment workers, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, I think there was sort of extra resistance uh, to uh, collective bargaining for teachers, especially because um, you know, one of the things I talk about in uh, one of the chapters in my manuscript is this idea of feminizing public finance, right? So the idea that uh, it's kind of this inversion of gender dynamics if you have this female workforce basically asking for uh, a greater portion of uh, a greater portion of public finance, and in particular, you know, the idea of taxpayer, especially as the '70s go on, is kind of racially uh, sorry, not racially coded. It is racially coded actually, but uh, is also kind of gender code, right? That it's a male kind of breadwinner. And so um, what's particularly interesting is by the end of the 70s, um, I've come across a lot of evidence of uh, people writing you know, letters to mayors and letters to the editor uh, saying stuff like, uh, don't you realize how high taxes are and how hard it is for working people to make a living? My husband is a carpenter and you know, he has, a, he has a real job and he can't find work and your excessive demands are making it difficult for him to, you know, basically kind of put food on the table. So, uh, you know, the answer is basically yes. I mean, I think it's, it's uh, gender is extremely relevant uh, to this discussion, and especially those codes of, the sort of coded language about like, you know, uh, who's, a, who's a producer of public services, who's a consumer of them, who's paying for it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it wandered into the teacher area, and, and the, the the as teachers have high salaries, uh, somehow that's an affront to people. Uh, but on the other hand, isn't it true that a lot of teachers, uh, well, do a lot of things for their students uh, out of their own personal sure. budget and cost? And I wonder how widespread is that? You know, is it, is it, is it two thirds or more, or is it, or is it, it, it just the isolated cases, or you know, uh, that kind of thing? And, and then I guess the other part of it is, don't people realize that they're doing that for their kids? You know, if 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 this is working in if the the right-wing rhetoric is working in, in rural and in other areas where, of course, the schools are a very vital part of the community. I and, and the Chicago teachers also comes to mind. I mean, it, it didn't work in Chicago. Rahm Emanuel wanted to uh, attack the teachers union, but the community rallied behind them. Yeah, you're, this is something I showed yesterday. 
Um, so I think this kind of encapsulates what you're talking about. So you're gonna, you're not worth all the money that we spend on you. You know, this sort of incredibly angry guy raising his fist in the by the end says, "But I'm gonna entrust you with the most precious thing in the world to me." You know, <laughs> it, it is kind of ironic. Um, you know, to your to your question about uh, how much uh, teachers pay out of their own expenses, you come across lots of examples of teachers writing letters to that effect in the 70s. Like, you know, you're asking us to take salary cuts. I already spend like hundreds of dollars a year on my teacher on supplies for students. Um, how widespread is that now? I don't know, but I can tell you that, and anybody who's done this knows, when you stand up in front of a classroom of kids and you're invested in their education, if you don't have enough supplies, uh, if you don't have a big enough supply budget to do what you need to do, you make it happen. You, you just do. I mean, it, and you know, I, just I, just about every teacher I've ever known was willing to do that. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a special relationship, like there is maybe with the healthcare uh, doctors and nurses, that they really care about their patients in spite of all the uh, greed talk and things like that. And, and I think it's true. I mean, I think uh, in, in spite of how a lot of teachers are treated in this country. Anyone who, who uh, can teach, just about anybody who stays in it, you know, they're they're not they're not going to kick up their heels and just not teach anything, right? Because you there's a lot of jobs you can do half-assed, right? But uh, a job in which you can literally see the effect on a kid in front of you is not a job that it's easy to do half-assed. Mm -hmm. So. Um Pretty much there. Maybe one last question if anybody's got one. Otherwise, Jen? I'll, I'll raise the last question. A, um, a brief comment and then followed by a question. So, the, the, the shift that you're describing in the language, the discourse that's, that's being used to talk about unionism, um, it seems to me that there's at least two broad ways that, um, that uh, organized labor could respond. One is to try to co-opt this very sort of uh, individualistic, uh, individual rights kind of language. And you see that, for instance, a few years ago with the title of the Employee Free Choice Act, uh, which is a way of sort of uh, uh, adopting that very language for, for pro union purposes. The other route would be, I remember uh, a few years ago, you mentioned uh, Joseph McCartan. He had a very interesting piece in Descent Magazine, that, uh, this was a few years ago, uh, arguing that the whole framing of uh, labor issues in terms of human rights was a strategic mistake because it simply reinforced the, the sort of uh, individualistic kind of premises that uh, people like the National Right to Work Committee use. And uh, he was arguing that uh, coming out of his own uh, work that a much better framing uh, is uh, the language of democracy, going back to, you know, there was a time when unions talked about industrial democracy. Mm -hmm. And that that's a very different way of framing things because it's majoritarian, it's not about individual rights, it's not about individual freedoms, it's about collective uh, self-determination and problem solving. And I'm wondering, so the question is, I'm wondering, uh, what do you see the implications of your own work pointing to as the more effective strategy? I mean, I think I know where, where I stand, but I'm curious what you think. Yeah, and, and I'll just go back to your comment for just a second, I think. Uh, Nelson Lichtenstein, another really prominent labor historian, has also basically argued that the language of civil rights, um, uh, the Equal Op Employment Opportunity Commission, for example, uh, locates uh, rights individually, right? You have to sue uh, rather than being able to do it collectively. Um, I think the kind of language that um, we've heard recently from people like Keith Ellison uh, is that making labor rights into a, uh, making that into a civil right is uh, really kind of important. Uh, but I think even sort of beyond that, I mean, I think, and I, I, talk, I sort of closed with this discussion yesterday as well, I mean, I think what we really have to do is uh, develop, on a, on a sort of cultural level, a, a sense of solidarity, you know? And I think um, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. It, it kind of starts, though, with basic sort of understanding that uh, the people who are extremely wealthy in this country, and not just in this country, but you know now they're a global elite basically, their interests are very different from just about everybody else, right? That, that I think was the message of, of Occupy Wall Street, right? That we're all being affected by this, that's what we have kind of in common. And in terms of a usable past, you know, uh, and this is another direction I almost went with my dissertation project, was uh, an examination of the Knights of Labor, because the idea of sort of one big union, I think, is uh, enormously interesting, right? That everyone's able to join, regardless of what their occupation is, unless they're 
basically wealthy. They also had a thing about lawyers, lawyers, and, and saloon keepers. Well, actually, so that's, that's it, made, it was also a language like, of working class republicanism, which of course isn't entirely lost. No, that, that's true too. That's, a, that's, a, that's um, uh, an important part of it, right? The idea that there's a sense of a common good mm -hmm. that we're kind of working toward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd be a little cautious about hearkening back too much to that kind of example, right? I mean, they were you know, viciously anti-Chinese, for example. Um, but, but I do think that we have to uh, develop, again, both a, a kind of a vocabulary for thinking about solidarities, um, but also it's going to take a heck of a lot of work, right? It's not, it's not something that, you know, we can't, we can't tweet our way to, you know, <laughs> democratic politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't. It, it takes face-to-face -face conversations with people, you know? And I think it, it's, it's not the kind of, uh, uh, it's not an easy fix, but I think it's going to take a lot of, Organizing on the ground, and and hopefully, um, uh, you know, I think I, I mean I think the labor movement, at least parts of it, especially like the AFT, for example, have gotten that message. And um, you know, so if, if there's uh, if there's anything that I'm optimistic about, it's that. Right. <laughs> One last pause for tomorrow, twelve twenty.